Okay, hi, hi everyone. So welcome to the colloquium talk. So this week the talk is organized by the AMS grad student chapter, and it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Hugh Oh. Sorry for pre pronunciation. So she will talk about unipotent flows on hy hyperbolic manifolds. Yeah. Welcome, please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I checked my calendar and then uh, actually I gave a colloquium to Tony Brook precisely five years ago. I think it was April 2016. <laughs> so thank you for inviting me again. And it's good to be back even, even if it's just virtually. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, let me start with actually uh, some classical example about lines in the torus. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I have a plane and then so consider this line, so the green line here. Uh, and of, of course, a line is closed in R2, but uh, what about the, the image of line if we go to the torus, so which is R2 over Z2? So I'm sure everybody knows the answer. So every line is either closed or dense in the torus T2. So more precisely, if the slope is rational, uh, it's going to become a closed line in the torus. And then if the slope is irrational, it will be dense. So it will go everywhere in the torus. Okay. So we can also consider higher dimensional generalization of this problem. So now consider uh, n-dimensional Euclidean space. And then let's consider maximal plane meaning that, okay, so find subspace of co-dimension one. And then, so what are the images of this maximal plane in n-dimensional torus, R to the n over Zn? And again, uh, it's either closed or dense uh, in n-dimensional torus, okay? But now uh, in Rn, in a higher dimensional space, if you look at actually uh, the close of a line in the higher dimensional torus, uh, then there are intermediate cases. It's not going to be just closed or dense, but in general, the close of a, close of a line in a higher dimensional torus T to the N is going to be some K torus for some K between one and N, okay? So this is the classical uh, example about the close of lines in torus. So, uh, so I want to discuss some generalization of this phenomenon, but in hyperbolic manifolds today. So. Oh, by the way, actually, feel free to interrupt me anytime, so I welcome questions. So here is the outline of my talk. So I begin with uh, 1936 theorem of Hedlund on horocycles in closed hyperbolic surfaces. And then uh, I will discuss a uh, generalization of Hedlund theorem by Beach on maximal horospheres in closed hyperbolic manifolds of any dimension. And then uh, I talk about Ratner theorem on unipotent flows on homogeneous spaces of finite volume. And finally, uh, I discuss some recent result on hyperbolic manifolds on infinite volume. Infinite volume. Okay. So let me start with this Hedlund theorem. Okay. So uh, so I first discussed uh, some basics about these hyperbolic manifolds. So I'm going to use a half plane model for the hyperbolic uh, space H2. So H2 is a simply X comma Y with a positive Y. And then the hyperbolic metric is the Euclidean metric over the Y coordinate. Okay, so simply I have a plane and then we are looking at the half of the plane with the hyperbolic metric. And then uh, in this model, of course, the boundary of H2 can be uh, identified with the real line, the real axis uh, with the pointed infinity, which is a topologically circle S1. And geodesics uh, in H2 are simply this vertical line or this vertical semicircle. Okay, these are geodesics in H2. And, uh, and uh, what we want to correct the horocycles are nothing but just Euclidean circles which are tangent to point on the boundary. Okay, so this is a Euclidean circle which is tangent to the boundary at this point. And this horizontal line, this is, is also a Euclidean circle. We want to think of it as a Euclidean circle, but which is tangent to at infinity. So these are horocycles. It's a very simple geometric object here. And uh, the group PSL2R actually acts on H2. So how? So instead of X comma Y, if I think of X comma Y as the complex number X plus I Y, then uh, the, the, so just maybe it's a transformation action on the complex number. So A, B, C, D uh, maps Z to A, Z plus B over C, Z plus D. So PSL2R actually preserves a path plane uh, via this action. 
So, and this action uh, preserves the metric. And moreover, uh, every actually orientation preserving isomatrix of H2 arises in this way. So we can identify the group of orientation preserving isomatrix of H2 with PSL2R, okay? And now any complete hyperbolic surface actually can be uh, obtained in this way. So it's going to be always quotient of H2 by some discrete subgroup gamma of PSL2R, okay? So if you have a discrete subgroup gamma of PSL2R, uh, either act on H2 properly discontinuously and also isometrically because uh, PSL2R uh, is an isometric group of H2. So we can form a quotient manifold. And any complete hyperbolic surface, we can just think of it in this way. So H2 by some discrete subgroup PSL2R. And when gamma is a co-compact discrete group, meaning that PSL2R uh, mode gamma is compact, uh, we obtain closed hyperbolic surface. Okay, so closed hyperbolic surface is obtained by H2 by co-compact discrete subgroup PSL2R. So here is my picture. So, so I have H2 and then we have some uh, quotient surface H2 by gamma and by horocycle in S in this quotient surface, uh, I simply mean uh, the projection, the image of horocycle in H2 via this under this quotient map. So we have this quotient map from H2 to H2 mod gamma, and then horocycle here means that the image of horocycle. Okay. So again, in H2, I mean, the, all the horocycles are closed, but what about uh, their images? So what is the distribution uh, of uh, horocycles enclosed in, uh, in hyperbolic surface? Uh, and Hadelund actually proved in 1936. So if S is a closed hyperbolic surface, then any horocycle is dense in S. Okay? So the image of this horizontal line, for instance, it goes everywhere and then fills out. And then also this horocycle goes everywhere, it fills out. So how did actually Hedlund, uh, okay, so before I talk about this, so I want to mention that actually this theorem is very specific about horocycles because the same theorem is very far from being true for geodesics. So it's a well-known fact that actually the geodesics actually uh, can behave very chaotically in closed hyperbolic surface. So for instance, uh, uh, it can be as wild as actually we wish for in terms of Hausdorff dimension. So uh, there's no nice description of closure of geodesics. So this theorem is very specific about horocycles. So how did actually Hedlund prove uh, this uh, uh, density of all horocycles. So he went to uh, the unit tangent bundle of H2. Okay. So instead of just looking at the points on H2, so you look at all the unit tangent vectors in H2, then we get this unit tangent bundle. And the action of PSL2R is actually on the unit tangent bundle, this is actually a simple transitive action. So which, uh, so therefore, actually, we can identify unit tangent bundle with the PSL2R. So everybody knows that actually, if I if I fix a vector here, then PSL2R actually uh, will stabilize this point. But just to stabilize a point will be PSO2. But if I just look at the vector, the direction together, then there is no stabilizer of PSL2R. So that gives us the actually identification of PSL2R with the T1 uh, H2. And similarly, if I have S, which is H2 by gamma, then the unit tangent bundle of this hyperbolic surface will be uh, this quotient space PSL2R mode gamma, so homogeneous space. So when I have a homogeneous space, when I say homogeneous space, it means that there is a transitive uh, action of some Lie group. That's what I mean. So here, this is homogeneous space because PSL2R acts transitively on this quotient space PSL2R mode gamma. So why is it actually nice to have this homogeneous space? Because if I just look at the surface, then it's very hard to do dynamics. Like how should we think of flows? But if I have homogeneous space, then any subgroup of PSL2R actually will act on this space by translations from right. So there is a dynamics actually on PSL2R by gamma by any subgroup action uh, coming from PSL2R. So this is a why actually it is nice to go to the unit tangent bundle than just looking at the uh, surface. Okay. And moreover, uh, the horocycles, 
they are obtained as projections of orbits of actually certain subgroup of PSL2R, which is actually this group U. So I'm defining this group U. Uh, it's a one parameter group consisting of this uh, upper triangular matrices, the one T01. Okay. So this group is an example of unipotent subgroup. So the word unipotent means that, so unipotent subgroup means that it consists of unipotent matrices. And a matrix is unipotent simply means that all the eigenvalues are equal to one. Okay. So here, of course, one T01, the eigenvalues are all, all one. So this is a unipotent matrix. So this is an example of unipotent subgroup. Okay. So more precisely, so I said actually all horocycles are obtained as projections of this U orbits. So for instance, uh, uh, in this horocycle, I fix a vector, a, a vector which is normal to this horocycle and which points to this uh, point that horocycle is tangent to the boundary. Okay. And if I look at the U orbit of this vector, then it will give me actually all the normal vectors to this, uh, I mean, located in the same horocycle. Okay. So therefore my original horocycle is the projection of this uh, U orbit of this vector. Okay. So I, I just fix one vector and then I look at U orbit and then I get all the normal vectors to this horocycle. And then I project it to the, I projected this picture to the surface, which means that I forget the arrows, so then I, I obtain the horocycle. Okay. So for instance, uh, when I look at this horocycle, now I, pick, I fix this vector, which is normal to this horocycle. And then the U orbit of this vector will be all these uh, upward normal vectors uh, based on the same horocycle. So if I understand actually topological behavior of this U orbit, then I get actually finer information than the topological behavior of horocycles. So in fact, actually, that's what Hedlund proved. So Hedlund proved that for every X in this quotient space PSL2R mod gamma, so you can think like, okay, I just fix one uh, tangent vector here on the surface. And then if I look at the U orbit, then uh, it goes everywhere. So the U orbit is dense inside the PSL2R mode gamma. Okay, so this is what Heather in the proofs. And then of course this implies that uh, every horocycle is dense. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So now I talk about uh, the generalization of a header in the theorem to higher dimension case, uh, which was uh, done by Beach. So again, like I consider n-dimensional hyperbolic space, and then I'm going to again look at the above space model. So it's just half of the n-dimensional Euclidean space with the last coordinate positive. And then the metric is again Euclidean metric uh, divided by y. Okay. So here's the picture. And then uh, as before, the geodesic lines are simply vertical line or this vertical semicircle. But I can also now consider geodesic k-planes. So the geodesic k-plane simply means that uh, it's a vertical uh, plane of dimension K or this vertical uh, semisphere of hemisphere of dimension K. Okay. When I'm in higher dimension, I can also think about this geodesic K planes. So of course, K can go all the way up to N, right? And now the maximal horospheres are uh, defined similarly. Now this time it's a Euclidean sphere, which is tangent to the point on the boundary. So I have this Euclidean sphere, which is the example of maximal horosphere. And then I can also consider this uh, uh, horizontal plane. This is also maximal horosphere, which is the tangent to infinity. So now uh, the group of isometries of HN uh, is the identity component of the special orthogonal group, uh, SON, comma one. So I actually uh, denote by this circle, uh, this is like the identity component of SON1. SON1 is not usually connected, so we, we take the identity component, but I will probably not say identity component all the time, but that's what I mean. So, and similarly, as before uh, in the surface case, the, any complete hyperbolic n manifold can be obtained uh, as the quotient of HN by a discrete subgroup of SON1. Okay. So because SON1 is an isometry group, any discrete group acts properly discontinuously, so we can consider the quotient manifold, and any complete hyperbolic manifold uh, can be just considered as the quotient of HN by discrete group. And uh, when I have a co-compact discrete group, uh, we obtain actually a closed hyperbolic manifold. So again, this is the picture. So so I have HN and then I have maximal horosphere here. 
And then again, by horosphere in hyperbolic uh, manifold, I mean the image of horosphere from HN under the quotient map. And this proved in 1975, uh, if M is a closed hyperbolic N manifold, then any maximal horosphere is dense in M. So again, like the image of this maximum horosphere equals everywhere in this uh, closed hyperbolic manifold. And when n is equal to two, this is precisely Hadron's the theorem. Okay. So now how did Beach prove this? So uh, he went to the uh, frame bundle of HN. So by frame bundle of HN, I mean actually it's the set of all oriented orthonormal frames okay, at point in HN. So now, if you look at this uh, frame bundle of HN, then uh, we can identify this frame bundle with this special orthogonal group S O n comma one. Okay. So you need, if you look at the unit tangent bundle, still like I have to take a quotient of S O n one by some compact group. But if you go all the way up to the frame bundle, then we do actually have this full Lie group S O n comma one. And similarly, if M is the hyperbolic manifold HN over gamma, then the frame bundle over M is going to be SON1 over gamma. Okay. And then as before, actually, so the maximal horosphere here, so maximal horosphere on M, they are projections of orbits of certain unipotent group U, which is given here. Okay. So this U, uh, is against the look at actually, uh, it again consists of unipotent matrices because all the matrices I wrote here, uh, they have ones in the diagonal and then they are all upper triangular matrices. Okay, so I have one here and then here I have a big block of uh, identity matrix and then one. So the non trivial entries uh, are here x1 to xn minus one. So this can be any vector in R to the n minus one. And then this component determines uh, here and then here. Okay. And then in fact, actually, U uh, is isomorphic to uh, R to the N minus one. This is abelian group. And this is a unipotent subgroup because every element is unipotent. And it is also maximal unipotent subgroup inside SON comma one, okay? And then again, every maximal horosphere uh, is obtained as the projection of this U orbit, like for instance here. So if I take this uh, uh, frame here, where the first vector, points to the uh, these tangents points of the horosphere, then the U orbit of this orthonormal frame will give me all the orthonormal frames on the same horosphere where the first vector actually points to the uh, this point of tangency of uh, horosphere. Okay. And what Beach proved is uh, this. So if you take any point X in this homogeneous space SON1 mod gamma, so again, see if the gamma is a co-compact lattice here because uh, I was talking about the closed hyperbolic manifold. So if I take any point X in this quotient space, then its U will be this dense. With the closure is everything. And okay, this implies that any maximal horosphere is dense in closed hyperbolic manifold. So this actually uh, leads us to the question. So what about if you look at horocycles instead of maximal horospheres? Okay. So I have now a higher dimension hyperbolic manifold, not just the surface. And so horocycle is, is the same definition. Uh, it's a Euclidean circle, uh, which is tangent to a point uh, on the boundary. So this is uh, any uh, line lying in a horizontal plane is a horocycle. And then any, right, this Euclidean circle tangent to this uh, point on the boundary is a horocycle. So now consider any horocycle and what can you say about now close of horocycles in HN over gamma? Okay. So when N is equal to two, it was had the theorem, but when N is equal to three or four, so this is not answered by uh, Hedlund or Beach. So it turns out actually, so this question is much more difficult and it goes actually beyond the technique of actually Hedlund and Beach. So here comes actually now Ratner theorem. Uh, So Ratner proved uh, the following very generous theorem. And this is one of the deepest theorems in uh, homogeneous dynamics. So her theorem is very general. So we take G to be any connected semi-simple linear Lie group. So, okay, so G can be SLNR or G can be this uh, also special orthogonal group we've been looking at, SON comma one. And let gamma be a lattice in G. So by lattice, what I mean is that 
It's a discrete subgroup of finite covolume. Okay, so gamma is a big discrete subgroup in the sense that if you look at the quotient to G mod gamma, it has finite volume. So of course, if it's a discrete subgroup, uh, if it's a co compact discrete subgroup, then the quotient is compact, so it will be a lattice. But however, uh, there are lattices which are not co compact, like SRNZ inside SRNR. Okay? So SRNZ uh, is not co compact inside SRNR, but uh, the quotient of SRNR by SRNZ has finite volume. So SRNZ is an example of a lattice. Okay, so now I have a, a some semi simple linear Lie group and the lattice. So we consider this quotient space G mod gamma. Then, uh, as, as I said before, so this quotient space is nice because uh, whatever the subgroup of G I have, actually, I can consider the translation action of this subgroup uh, from the right on this G mod gamma. And the Ratner theorem is about uh, action of this uh, subgroup uh, by translations on G mod gamma. So so Ratner considered the special kind of uh, subgroups. Uh, so H is going to be a connected subgroup generated by unipotent elements. Okay. So here actually the word unipotent is very important. So H could be a unipotent subgroup because I mean, of course, unipotent subgroup consists of unipotent elements. So therefore it is generated by unipotent elements, but H does not have to be a unipotent group as long as it is generated by unipotent elements. So here's a statement of Ratner theorem is sometimes called the orbit closure theorem. And this was conjectured by Raghunathan before, okay? So her statement is this. So take any point X in G mod gamma, then uh, she says that then the orbit of X under H, the closure of XH is always a homogeneous space of another Lie group L containing H, okay? So, yeah, this is actually very, very powerful theorem. So, uh, so actually, it is a consequence of Moore's ergodicity theorem, which says that almost every point, so for every for almost every point in G mod gamma, H orbit is going to be dense. So we know that the closure of X H will be G mod gamma for almost all point X. But the problem with actually this kind of statement is that if you give me your favorite point X then I won't be able to tell you whether the H orbit of that point is dense or not, okay? Because even though I know that for almost all points it has to be dense, but I won't be able to say anything about the specific point, okay? But what Ratner theorem is that, says is that if you give me any point you want, then I can tell you what the closure of that orbit is, okay? So the power of this uh, theorem is about actually classification of every orbit closure. Okay, so every uh, H orbit is a homogeneous space of another Lie group containing H. Any questions about the statement of Ratner theorem? So in fact, actually a very, very special case of Ratner theorem already implies uh, a long-standing conjecture of Oppenheim. Uh, so the special case is this. So, so in this case, in this special case, G mod gamma is going to be SL3 modulo SL3Z. So I said actually SL3Z is a lattice inside SL3R. So I can uh, consider this space SL3R mod SL3Z. And then my H is going to be the identity component of SO21, okay? Of course, SO21 is not uh, unipotent, but it is generated by unipotent elements. So uh, I can apply Ratner theorem, uh, letting this subgroup to be H. And also uh, in this example, SO21 is known to be a maximal subgroup of SL3R, okay? So which means that, so what does Ratner theorem says? Now I take any point in this space and then I look at the SO21 orbit and then its closure uh, has to be an orbit of some intermediate subgroup between SO21 and SL3R. But SO21 is a maximal subgroup, which means that there is no intermediate subgroup. The L has to be either H or SL3R. And when L is H, I get the closed uh, orbit. The closure of XH uh, is same as XH, which means that H orbit is closed. And then when uh, this, uh, the subgroup is G, I get actually the density statement for that orbit. 
So this uh, Ratner theorem implies that in this special case, uh, for the action of SO2 on inside SL3 or mode SL3Z, every orbit is either closed or dense. Okay. So open eye conjecture, this is uh, some statement about, uh, roughly is a statement about uh, density of uh, uh, the values of, values of irrational quadratic forms on integral vectors uh, when there are more than three variables. And this conjecture uh, formulated in 1929. So this was actually proved by Magulis in 1987 before Ratner proved her theorem. So Magulis actually proved a little bit weaker statement than this special case, which was enough to uh, imply uh, open eye conjecture. Okay. And let me also mention that in fact, actually it was precisely the relation of this open eye conjecture uh, with this type of orbit closure statement which motivated the Raghunathan actually to formulate this statement. So you see actually even a very, very special case of this Rathana theorem implies actually this very powerful uh, long-standing conjecture in number theory. So now going back to actually our problem about the closure of horror cycles. So Rathana theorem also implies this statement. So consider uh, any hyperbolic manifold of finite volume then uh, Ratner's theorem implies that the closure of any horror cycle. So here not, I'm not insisting uh, maximal horror sphere. So just uh, one dimensional horror cycle. So then the closure of any horror cycle is always properly immersed submanifold. Okay. So how does actually one deduce this statement from Ratner's theorem? So we look at this uh, frame bundle of M, which is SO N1 mod gamma. And then because I assumed actually uh, M has finite volume, this means precisely gamma is a lattice inside SON1. So I'm in the setting of Ratner's uh, theorem, G mod gamma, where gamma is a lattice. And then uh, any horror cycle, any one dimensional horror cycle, again, is the projection of an orbit of one dimensional subgroup of my maximal unipotent subgroup. Okay, so my H is going to be any one dimensional subgroup of this maximal unipotent subgroup because it's a subgroup of unipotent subgroup, it is a unipotent subgroup. Okay, so therefore I can apply Ratner theorem to this uh, uh, orbit of H and Ratner theorem says that any H orbit is a homogeneous space of Lie group, which means that from frame bundle, when I go to my manifold, uh, it's a still nice manifold. I mean, because this covering of a frame bundle of a manifold, the fibers are just compact. So if I'm closed, nice upstairs, I'm still nice downstairs. There's no funny thing happening. Okay? So this Ratner theorem implies uh, the statement actually we are looking for. So it gives a classification of all possible closures of horror cycles. Ratner theorem also implies that uh, the closure of geodesic planes are properly immersed submanifold. Okay? So remember, actually, this statement is not true for one dimensional geodesic line, because I said, actually, the geodesic lines actually behave very chaotically. But as soon as actually I look at uh, at least the dimension two, so geodesic plane, uh, then Ratner theorem can be applied. And then it says that the closure of any geodesic plane is again a properly immersed submanifold. So I'm just recalling you, like, what are the geodesic planes? So uh, this is a picture in H3 or, or HN. So geodesic plane is simply the vertical plane or the vertical hemisphere. And Ratner theorem says that the closure of the geodesic plane, when you go to the hyperbolic manifold of finite volume, the closure is always nice properly immersed submanifold. So to obtain this theorem from Ratner's uh, theorem, uh, we simply have to understand this. So it turns out any geodesic K plane is the projection of, again, like some orbits of subgroup action in SO N1 mod gamma, and then this subgroup is SO K comma one. Okay. So if it's a geodesic K plane, so geodesic plane of dimension K, then they always arise as orbit of this subgroup, special orthogonal subgroup K comma one inside SO N comma one. And why do you need actually, why do I need actually this dimension to be at least two? Because uh, SOK comma one, if K is equal to one, it's not generated by unipotent elements. SO one comma one, this is simply diagonal group. Okay, so it's not generated by unipotent elements, but 
as soon as k is at least two, this is so k comma one is generated by unipotent elements. So therefore, I can apply Ratner theorem. So Ratner theorem says that every SOK1 orbit uh, is dense in some homogeneous space of a Lie group. Okay, so their closures are always very nice. So that statement gives that the closure of Jodas plane is properly immersed the submanifold. So in particular, n is equal to three. So uh, if I look at Jodas plane, which means that uh, I'm looking at SO21 orbits inside SO31, comma, gamma, and SO21 is a maximal subgroup inside SO3, comma, 1. So again, like uh, there is no intermediate subgroup between SO21 and SO31. So therefore, this Ratner theorem actually uh, gives this dichotomy for the geodesic plane in hyperbolic three manifold or finite volume. So any geodesic plane is either closed or dense. Okay, so here's the say some picture for the closed geodesic plane and then um, dense geodesic plane. So let me just say actually this uh, this case actually the closed geodesic plane is very miraculous. So so what is the picture? So I have uh, this uh, H three uh, a pop space and then see I have some vertical plane which is a geodesic plane and then I am taking. Uh, the image of this geodesic plane under the quotient map, H3 goes to H3 by some discrete group gamma, okay? And of course, here is closed, but to be actually the image to be closed in this quotient space, some kind of miracle has to happen because mostly likely this symmetry or the identification by elements of gamma will mess things up. So when we have this closed geodesic surface, this is very rare. It can only happen actually countably many times, but it does happen. Uh, but most of uh, uh, the geodesic plane uh, will be dense. Okay? But her theorem says, okay, there are no intermediate cases. But, but if you go to the higher dimensional case, then there will be intermediate cases in general, because I can have a geodesic plane, which is dense in some properly immersed hyperbolic three manifold when my entire manifold is hyperbolic four manifold. So there could be intermediate cases, just like the, I mean, the example of line uh, in the higher dimension tori actually, we, we looked at in the very beginning of the lecture. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so, so here's actually now main topic of my lecture. So those Ratner theorem still hold in the infinite volume setting. So remember actually the big hypothesis in Ratner theorem was that we asked the gamma to be a lattice inside the, uh, our semi-simple group. So Ratner's theorem, all the implications are about finite volume manifolds, okay? Finite volume hyperbolic manifolds. It doesn't say anything about infinite volume hyperbolic manifolds. So, but we wanted to see actually whether there is any chance that actually uh, this uh, topological rigidity actually can persist uh, uh, in some of the infinite volume examples. So in general, the answer is no. So there are actually certain hyperbolic three manifold actually, which are in fact actually crazy function hyperbolic three manifold, which contains some of geodesic planes uh, with very wide closures. So roughly speaking, this, this kind of the manifolds can be considered some kind of a product of a closed hyperbolic surface times R, okay? Then I said actually the geodesics can have a very wide closure in the closed hyperbolic surface. So for some of the crazy function manifold actually, it turns out we can actually uh, propagate actually this uh, wide closures of geodesic uh, line to the wild closure of geodesic play. So we can actually, we can write down actually some examples of this crazy function three manifolds where there's no hope for Ratner's theorem. Like there's no topological rigidity for Judas planes, okay? But however, there are actually a very nice family of uh, hyperbolic manifolds of infinite volume. Uh, we do have an analog of Ratner's theorem, okay? So for the rest of my talk, so I'm going to explain actually what are these hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, we have Ratner's theorem. Um, and some consequences of that. Okay, so these manifolds are convex or compact type volume manifolds with the Fuchsian ends. So now let me define what they are. Okay. So, okay, so 
Uh, remember, so I saw N1, this special orthogonal group. Uh, this is the group of all orientation preserving isomatrices of HN. So uh, I fixed some discrete group gamma. So, and then I assume actually it's a risky dense. So this is not a very serious assumption, but uh, it's more convenient for me to just assume this uh, gamma is a risky dense. See, but I'm not going to assume gamma is a lattice because I want to give some examples of infinite volume hyperbolic manifolds. Okay. So, and I consider M, which is the associated hyperbolic manifold, so HN quotient by gamma. And uh, when we study actually hyperbolic manifold of infinite volume, so the notion of a limit set uh, plays a very important role. So what is the limit set? So limit set, uh, this is associated to gamma. So take any, so this is my picture of a, a, a pop space. So take any base point O here. And then if you look at the gamma orbit of this base point, since gamma is properly discontinuously, so there is no accumulation uh, of this gamma orbit on the hyperbolic space, but, uh, but we'll have accumulation points on the boundary. Yeah, infinitely many points must accumulate somewhere in the complex space, right? And then if I add a boundary, then the hyperbolic, we, I am looking at the compactification of this hyperbolic space uh, together with the boundary. And the set of all accumulation points on this boundary, these are exactly what is called the limit set. Uh, of gamma. And if gamma is a lattice, in fact, actually, the limit set will be a whole boundary. So it's not going to be a very interesting set. If it's a lattice, uh, then you see actually uh, all the points in the boundary uh, in this uh, accumulation set of the orbit. But when gamma is not a lattice, uh, so in, in general, we get a very interesting uh, uh, fractal set. So I think, uh, is it Timothy? Like, yeah. No, is it Jason? Like, I mean, like there's one of the yeah, audience has this background, which is the limit set of the Kleinian group, something like that pretty, yeah, a fractal set arises as a limit set of a, a discrete group, right? So, and another actually important object uh, is what's called the convex core of M. So convex core of uh, this hyperbolic manifold M is defined as the quotient of convex core of the limit set uh, divided by gamma. So what is the convex whole of the limit set? So just take any two points in the limit set and then the geodesic connecting these two points on the limit set, these are just the vertical circle connecting these two points, okay? And whole of lambda means that it's the smallest convex subspace which contains all the geodesics connecting the limit set, okay? So this is going to be a subspace of HN and then we look at the quotient of this whole of lambda by gamma. So by definition, convex core of M is a sub-manifold of my entire manifold HN mod gamma. And, uh, and convex core is, can be also characterized by a uh, smallest convex sub-manifold, which is homotopic to M. So it captures actually all the non-trivial topology of M, but in, in general, it's much smaller than M. Okay. So now with these two definitions, now so I can now define a uh, what I mean by this uh, convex compact manifold with the Fuchsian end. So by convex core compact, I simply mean the convex core is compact. Okay. So the entire manifold uh, does not have to be compact, but uh, the co co convex core can be compact. And in that case, we call the manifold is convex core compact. So actually here is a good picture that uh, to have in mind. So, so since I'm kind of considering the infinite volume hyperbolic manifold, so maybe this is my entire manifold, but, uh, but suppose I have a core of M which is compact like this. So this is the example of a convex compact manifold. Okay. And uh, yeah, so usually the convex core of M, this is a compact, so in, when M is convex compact, so this is compact manifold with, with some boundary here. And now we say M has Fuchsian ends if, all the boundary component of this convex core of M is totally geodesic. Okay. So again, in this picture, so this is my core and then the, here are my boundary surfaces. And then in general, uh, they don't have to be totally geodesic, but if all these boundary surfaces of convex core is a totally geodesic, then we say M has Fuchsian end. Because in that case, the end component of M looks like just this uh, uh, nice totally geodesic sub manifold times R plus. So the Fuchsian ends refers to uh, this kind of end component. Okay. So this is the definition of convex or compact manifold with the Fuchsian end. 
But this manifold actually can also be characterized uh, by the limit step. So for convex or compact manifold, uh, M has Fuchsian ends if and only if uh, the limit set uh, satisfies the following property. So we look at the complement of the limit set. So S to the N minus one, this is the boundary of HN, is, is the sphere of dimension N minus one. Then the complement of limit set must be a disjoint union of round balls, uh, which has mutually closures, mutually disjoint closures. So here is the example when uh, n is equal to three. So n is equal to three, uh, my boundary of H is three. This is a plane with a pointed infinity, right? S2. So, uh, and then I have infinitely many round discs here. So I have infinitely many round open discs uh, whose closures do not touch each other. So I was careful so that actually all these closures of round discs do not touch each other. And then my limit set will be exactly the complement of all these uh, round open disks. So you should imagine I scoop up all these uh, round open disks and then, uh, and I also scoop out actually uh, this exterior of this biggest circle here. Then what remains will be some kind of a fractal set on the plane. And if the limit set looks like that, so that is actually topologically what is called the Sierpinski carpet. So if the limit set looks like a Sierpinski carpet, uh, which is complement of this infinitely many round disks, then uh, the corresponding manifold has always a function end. Okay. So in higher dimension, okay, if n is four, then uh, my round disks now becomes round balls. So again, like uh, I have this infinitely many round balls uh, whose closures do not touch each other. And then when I scoop out all these round balls, I am remained with actually uh, some fractal set uh, in R3, and if my limit cell looks like that, then co corresponding manifold has function end. Okay, so now actually I explain more explicitly how one constructs actually this hyperbolic manifold with the function end. So let's first consider the case of the surface. So when n is equal to two, so any convex or compact uh, surface, in fact, do, does have actually function ends and they are always constructed in this way. So take any closed hyperbolic surface. Okay, so I, here I draw the hyperbolic surface of genus two and take any simple closed geodesic. Okay, and then I cut along this simple closed geodesic. Then we obtain this uh, compact hyperbolic surface, but now with the boundary. Okay, so I cut along this. So then I get these two boundary components of compact hyperbolic surface. Okay. But this is not a complete hyperbolic surface. So I want to make it complete. So I glue this uh, function ends which is simply the simple closed geodesic times R plus, okay? And this is exactly, uh, yeah, compact, compact surface with the function end. So here I took one simple closed geodesic, but I don't have to take one. I can take finitely many disjoint simple closed geodesics and then cut along all of them, okay? Then I get uh, some compact hyperbolic surface with many boundary components. But for each boundary, I can glue some function end and then make it complete. And then I obtain complete hyperbolic surface, uh, which are exactly uh, what I call convex co compact uh, hyperbolic surface with the function end. Okay? So in, the, in n is equal to two case, every convex co compact surface has function end. But in higher dimension case, so we start with, again, some closed hyperbolic manifold. So uh, by most of rigidity theorem, there are only countably many closed hyperbolic manifolds. Okay? So we have countably many closed hyperbolic manifolds and some closed hyperbolic manifolds has properly embedded the co-dimension one geodesic plane and some do not. Okay? Of course, I mean, in, in closed hyperbolic surface, every closed hyperbolic surface contains a simple closed geodesic. But now if I go to higher dimension, then not every uh, closed hyperbolic manifold will have uh, some properly embedded uh, co-dimension one to display. But there are countably many of them. So we consider this class and then we do the same surgery. So this is my closed hyperbolic manifold with some properly embedded uh, totally geodesic plane. Say I call it S and then I cut along this. Okay? Then I obtain some compact hyperbolic three manifold with a totally geodesic boundary. It's not complete, so I glue exactly this S, my geodesic plane, times R plus to make it complete. Okay. 
so this is how I obtain convex compact hyperbolic three manifold with the Fuchsian end. So this will be precisely my convex core here, and then uh, this will give me my uh, total geodesic boundary of the core, and this is a Fuchsian end. Okay, so you, it's always obtained like this. You can take uh, finitely many uh, mutually disjoint properly embedded co-dimension one geodesic place and cut along them, and then glue Fuchsian ends, and then we obtain uh, this countably many class of convex or compact hyperbolic manifolds with the Fuchsian ends. Okay, so now here is the main theorem. So, uh, so let N be a convex or compact hyperbolic N manifold, N has to be at least three and with the Fuchsian ends. Then the theorem is that the closure of any horocycle or the closure of any geodesic plane, they are always properly immersed submanifold. So this is the first class of infinite volume, yeah. Uh, case where we prove this analog of Ratner theorem. So for the dimension three case, so it was proved in joint work with McMullen and Mohammadi uh, four or five years ago. And then for higher dimension, uh, it was proved uh, uh, in joint work with my student Lee. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So uh, I also want to mention that actually, so there is another way to actually rephrase this statement in terms of orbits of circles, because I like circles, so I want to discuss this uh, implication uh, quickly. So uh, remember like, so, so this convex or compact manifold with the Fuchsian uh, ends, so their limit cell looks like uh, this in the dimension three case, and then uh, in higher dimension, it looks like this uh, complement of, uh, uh, yeah, complement of infinitely many round open bores. So the studying actually behavior of geodesic plane, this is actually completely equivalent to, to study the orbits of a circle on the boundary. The, the reason is that, remember like uh, uh, if I, for instance, in the hyperbolic three manifold, this was my geodesic plane, yeah, the vertical plane. So this geodesic plane is completely determined by circle on the boundary, okay? So if I know actually all the gamma orbits of a circle on the boundary, then actually uh, it gives me a description of uh, the behavior of geodesic planes in the manifolds and vice versa. So this theorem I just formulated uh, for geodesic plane actually can be uh, rephrased uh, in terms of the closure of gamma orbits of any circle on the boundary. Okay. So I'm, I, I probably not state this, but then actually it's not very hard to figure out what this statement has to be from the statement about the closure of geodesic planes. Okay, so, so actually in my abstract, I promised you that I give you countably many hyperbolic manifolds of infinite volume uh, for general n, but I also promised you that actually for dimension three, I'm gonna give you actually continuous family of hyperbolic three manifolds uh, where we have an analog of Ratna. So now I explain what that continuous family is. So remember like uh, uh, to, for this example of hyperbolic manifolds with the Fuchsian end, we started with the countably many closed hyperbolic end manifold, and then we did some surgery. So then we got this hyperbolic end manifold with the Fuchsian end. So I kind of consider this hyperbolic end manifold with the Fuchsian ends as children of closed hyperbolic manifolds. Okay, yeah. You find some properly embedded co-dimension one geodesic plane, and then you cut and then glue, and then you, you obtain this uh, countably many uh, this manifolds with the Fuchsian ends. And for three manifold actually, so all this uh, Thurston uh, score actually, or this low dimensional topology people actually uh, tell me that actually, there's a huge deformation space of this hyperbolic three manifolds with the Fuchsian ends. Okay. So what are they? So for instance, okay, so let's consider this example of uh, hyperbolic three manifold, uh, with Fuchsian end, this means that I have here convex core, and then here I have a totally geodesic uh, boundary of the convex core. Okay, so I have here totally geodesic surface, and then consider the Tycomla space of this hyperbolic surface times the Tycomla space of uh, this hyperbolic surface here. Okay, so take any element from here and then any element from here, which means that choose any hyperbolic structure on this boundary component and then choose any hyperbolic structure on this boundary component, then, uh, then the theory says that, then there exists hyperbolic three manifold, which realizes that hyperbolic three 
which realize that hyperbolic structures at, on the boundary of the convex core. Okay, it's not going to be a totally geodesic anymore, but there is actually three manifold which realize the, those hyperbolic structures. And then since the Tycomola space of S1, this is uh, isomorphic to the Euclid R to the six genus minus six, and then again, this is R to the six genus minus six. So we have here not only continuous, but huge family of actually these deformations. Okay. And uh, the deformed one is not going to have a Fuchsian end because this is not going to be a totally geodesic anymore. So this is why we call this crazy Fuchsian end. It's going to be like a wiggly thing, but so that I want to call it crazy Fuchsian end. Okay. Uh, this is very special about dimension three because uh, for higher dimension, if dimension is four or bigger, then um, there is a theorem by Steve Kirchhoff and Peter Storm, which says that there is no local deformation of hyperbolic n manifolds with the Fuchsian end. Okay. So again, actually, so now now so because there's no example here, so I want to now actually focus on this uh, hyperbolic three manifold with the crazy Fuchsian end. So these manifolds can also be characterized in terms of the limit set. So these are convex or compact manifolds whose complement of limit set is the disjoint union of Jordan disks with mutual disjoint closures. So remember, so for the hyperbolic manifolds with the crazy Fuchsian end, so the limit set was the complement of round open disks, but now we allow Jordan disks. Okay? So the picture is like this. So I have like this wiggly Jordan disks and then the limit set will be complement of this weekly Jordan disks. Okay, so convex or compact manifold whose limit set looks like that, uh, they correspond to what I call this uh, convex or compact hyperbolic manifold with crazy Fuchsian end. So for this uh, class of manifolds, so uh, we have this analogous theorem uh, to Ratna. So this was proved uh, in joint work with McMullen and Muhammadi. So let M be now convex or compact hyperbolic three manifold with crazy Fuchsian ends. Okay. And now I'm going to consider M star, the interior of the convex core of M. Okay. So since it's a convex compact hyperbolic three manifold, the convex core is some compact manifold with the boundary. So I simply remove the boundary. Then I'm remained with the uh, interior of the convex core. Okay, so I have some open submanifold, for the interior of the convex core. And then the theorem is that any geodesic plane is either closed or dense in this uh, interior of the convex core. Okay. So when uh, the manifold had the Fuchsian end, not only PH Fuchsian, Fuchsian end, actually, uh, I didn't have to look at M star. And that the same statement is true when I look at actually the whole manifold. But in this case, I do have to look at only the interior of the convex core because. So student of Kurt, uh, student of McMullen, uh, Yong Guan Zhe, actually he constructed the example of a convex or compact hyperbolic three manifold with the crazy Fuchsian end, which has a plane which is properly uh, immersed inside M star, but it accumulates on the boundary of the core. So if I remove this M star, the statement is not going to be true anymore. Okay. So for this uh, statement, uh, so the correct ambient space is this M star instead of M. Okay, so and then we have this correct statement, and I think this is the first theorem actually that any this topological rigid uh, theorem is proved for continuous family of the manifolds. I mean, because of Margulis arithmeticity, so any actually uh, and and together with the most of strong rigidity. As long as uh, the ambient group is not PSL2, there are only countably many lattices. So all these examples of Rotten applied only countably many classes. But uh, but this uh, I mean the richness of this hyperbolic three manifold actually gave us chance to prove something for count I mean for continuous family of these hyperbolic manifolds. Okay, so. Now I have a few minutes and then I'll just say a very few brief words, like what is the difficulty of doing dynamics in infinite volume setting? Okay. So, okay, this is only the first difficulty, but let me explain like, uh, what do you need actually to move from finite volume setting to the infinite volume setting? So my universe has become like too large. So the, the point is this, suppose you is say some one parameter unipotent subgroup, unipotent subgroup, some flow, okay? So if my space, uh, entire space, if my universe is compact, 
then every U orbit remains in a compact subset, yeah? Because my entire space is compact, I cannot go out. So my U orbit must remain in a compact subset, okay? But now move to the next case. Now suppose I'm in the finite volume setting, but again, like the finite volume does not mean it's a compact, but, so, but it is compact union some cusp. This is how finite volume looks like, okay? So already here, so if I consider U orbit, typically it will go to, it will go to cusp, but it will come back again. Okay, but it might go out, it might, might want to leave actual complex set, but it will come back again. And it is a pure theorem of Danima, this is not a non-trivial theorem. So if I'm considering the unipotent one parameter subgroup, then every U orbit spends 90, 90% of time in a complex subset. Okay, so it might go back, but still it spends a lot of time in a complex subset. So when I'm doing dynamics, I can almost pretend that I don't have this cousin, okay, because of this phenomenon. But however, now if I'm in an infinite volume situation, then this is again soft ergodic theory uh, in infinite ergodic theory, almost all U orbit will spend 0% of time in a compact set. So it will go out, but see the universe is too vast. You don't want to come home. They will just spend so much time out in the universe and then it may come back once in a while, but it will still go out. And then in the end, actually spends 0% of time in a complex subset. So this is actually somehow the difficulty because what is it, what does it mean? If you want to understand the closure, then if your orbit is not closed, then you want to understand what are the accumulation points, right? So because the closure means the set of all accumulation points, you want to understand the accumulation points, but then somehow this orbit doesn't give me chance to look at this, uh, what is happening around, I mean, accumulation points too closely because it goes out too far and then just comes back to this compact part, like only too rarely before I look at too closely, it already left, something like this. So somehow understanding actually this uh, recurrence to a compact set, uh, this is the, the first difficulty. And in fact, actually, this is the very region which distinguishes uh, this quasi function three manifold, where we have no hope for Ratner theorem, and this uh, three manifold with the Fuchsian ends. So, this for convex or compact three manifold with the Fuchsian ends, we are able to understand the structure of this return time to some certain complex subset. Okay? Somehow, the geometry uh, also, uh, as well as the topology of three manifold, has a huge influence on how much time the unipotent uh, flow actually is supposed to spend the time in a complex subset, even if it's a 0% of time. Like, okay, we can look at finer, 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 and then how often does it return, even if it's a 0% time. And then somehow this uh, geometry of the hyperbolic three manifold has the influence, and then we are able to identify exactly the right, right class of uh, uh, hyperbolic manifolds uh, where actually we can do some reasonable dynamics. Okay, so thank you. I think oh, my time is up. Thank you. Any questions, comments? So if you consider this deformation of the manifold with Fuchs and ends to quasi Fuchs and ends, do you expect that this unipotent flow will dramatically change? There is no structural, some kind of structural stability involved. What, what is your expectations or maybe I know what is happening for sure. <clears throat> uh, right, so, so actually uh, for Hyperbolic manifold with the Fuchsian ends, actually, see, if you look at this, my statement, I mentioned the closure of Horo cycle as well as closure of Judas plane, the both are properly immersed the sub manifold. But for quasi Fuchsian uh, end, I only stated the statement for the Judas plane because I don't know about the closure of Horo cycle. So for this understanding of actually recurrence time for unipotent flow, it was actually just good enough to understand the Judas plane and then. My sense is that maybe the, this kind of statement is not true for a cycle. There will be some erratic horror cycles uh, when, the, when there is a crazy function and the, but, but the, there is no counter example yet. So this Yung Guan Zhang's example is only about the geodesic planes. Yeah. So what, 
maybe more precisely, could you say what kind of information do you have about this return times? So what what is uh -huh. the flavor flavor of this information that you need? Okay, so uh, I need uh, so we say something like uh, k pick recurrent times. So k is some fixed number. So I would like to have some compact subset in the frame bundle that when I look at the unipotent orbit, the return time is k thick, meaning that for every scale r, I would like at least one point in the window r and k r, at least one point in this window to come back. Okay, it's something like a Cantor set condition. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, yeah, the measure will be zero. The Lebesgue measure of this return time is zero, but then for any window R and KR, I have this uh, okay. multiplicative window. So That's and K has to be so. fixed. Yeah, for That's any so scale. In the, mm -hmm. in the logarithmic scale, you have some frequency. Some yes, problem. yes, okay. yeah. So, Somehow, right, so I don't know if Dennis came. So, so there is a, in the frame bundle, like the, we, we cannot look at the full frame bundle, but we look at what's called the renormalized frame bundle. So it is some, uh, some subset, uh, some complex subset in the frame bundle. And then uh, we understand that through the recurrence time uh, for the Fuchsian end case, but for the creative Fuchsian end actually, somehow the, uh, I cannot take arbitrary point from this uh, renormalized frame bundle, but there is actually even smaller complex subset inside this renormalized frame bundle where we do have actually this k thick recurrent time. And the reason uh, we can prove this statement to use is actually this, uh, I mean, this deformed spaces are k quasi conformally conjugate to the one uh, with, with the Fuchsian ends. Yeah, so it uses these theories, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. About the junk example, can it be deformed? So by deform, I mean, can we deform uh, the complex structure on this quasi Fuchsian group so that the junk example persists? Or do we need to kind of come up with some, some special conformal structure of this quasi Fuchsian ends? Uh, can, you, can you repeat your question again? Uh, well, can the junk example be deformed? Ah, the example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and if yes, what would happen with the example when we move into the direction of uh, Fuchsian and maybe? Yeah, I don't. I think his example is a very particular single example, so it's very actually hard to pin down actually this uh, yeah example of plane, and then he was able to find the one single example actually where you find the one single plane where this uh, exotic behavior happened. Yeah. So I think asking this example to persist under deformation, I think this is a lot to ask. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Somehow the geodesic planes actually kind of, yeah, it's very subtle actually. Yeah. So uh, the Ratner theorem, well, like Margulis theorem, the Ratner theorem had had quite a few number theoretic applications, as far as I can tell. So do you anticipate some number theoretic so consequences of the theory that you you're doing? Um, it is orthogonal. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I can say one thing. So. So if you know actually uh, this, uh, I mean, Gromov and then Piazzi Shapiro's construction of non-arithmetic hyperbolic three manifold. So this uh, actually hyperbolic manifold with the Fuchsian ends. These are exactly the players of this Gromov's construction of uh, non-arithmetic hyperbolic manifold. Mm -hmm. And then, so something like using this analogy. So uh, actually, I didn't mention Yves Bonoir's name, but his name appeared in the abstract of my lecture. So I only talked about convex co compact case, but actually a similar theorem, uh, the last theorem has an analog for geometrically finite case. So the same theorem works for geometrically finite a cylindrical manifold. And then, so we could, uh, we, we looked at some question like this. So, so you have a, some, uh, yeah, closed hyperbolic manifold and then 
maybe upstairs to, you have this convex or compact manifold with the Fuchsian end. So you could ask uh, when the geodesic plane, if there's any relation between geodesic plane upstairs and downstairs. Okay. And then the, there is a nice relation for arithmetic cases. And then, uh, and then in general, there are no nice, nice relations uh, for non arithmetic uh, coverings. So I guess th that's all I can say about the relation of this theory with the uh, arithmeticity. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Okay, if there are no more questions, then thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep.